It's quarter to 12, Nigeria. We either get it right or we fall off the brink. It's quarter to 12, Nigeria. Every month, we speak to remarkable Nigerians about their lives, work, and the lived Nigerian experience. This month, I'm speaking with Richard Morfe Damijo, or as everyone calls him, RMD. He's a legendary Nigerian actor, writer, producer, and lawyer. He's also worked as a journalist and also as a former commissioner for culture and tourism in Delta State. In 2005, he won the African Movie Academy Award for Best Actor in a Leading Role, and most recently starred in the highly anticipated limited series, The King of Boys, The Return of the King. Thank you so much, Richard Morfe Damijo, popularly called RMD, for joining me on Quarter to Twelve. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yes, um, I mean, you turned 60 not yes. too long ago. Big party. Yes. <laughs> you don't look a day over 45, I must say. Thank you, thank you. What's the secret? I, I, I have been asked that, that question a couple of times. I, I wish I really knew. I mean, I do all the things like I try to eat right, I try to exercise when I'm not lazy. Um, so if that is it, yes. But I think also that... But people do that, and somehow they don't look like you. <laughs> that's, so, so that's where I'm going. So I think I'm just graced... You know, um, you're just naturally fine. Just that's what you're saying. Yeah, that's it. You know, something, in, something that my 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 that God must have dropped in my DNA that that helps me because I, mean, I, I really I, I, don't I'm know. I'm slightly younger than you, and I'm looking at your eyes. Not a bag in sight, and look at me. <laughs> and I'm thinking that could be work, though. <laughs> well, I try to sleep. Yeah, yeah. I work. In fact, hard. I work. I work very, very long hours, and in fact. Now I'm not slowing down, which is ironic because I'm supposed to be slowing down. My mm. kids look at me sometimes like, come on, you know. So I'm like, but I, that's all I know. Yeah. I've been working 37 years and wow. I just don't feel like I have done anything. So I guess it's a good thing, right? So that's, that's the drive, isn't it? The need to sort of do more and achieve more. Are, are you one of those people who are sort of really hard on themselves and you, don't, you, you do something, you don't sit down to actually even just take it in and you're already looking at the next thing? Absolutely. I, I'm very hard on myself and sometimes it really, it really does scare me because um, I was telling some young actors a few days ago that I'm excited about seeing tapes from the 90s when I started out in Hollywood because I don't watch them. Mm. I didn't watch myself. Mm. If there is no premiere where I go all dressed up, I, I wouldn't watch it. Uh, for instance, um, KOB started yesterday, King of Boys yes. started yesterday, I'm in it, in the new one. I tried to watch, I couldn't get past the first, second episode, I saw myself and after a while I was just like, you know what? I can't. <laughs> you know, it's so tough for me because if I see a million ways that I could have done something. I, I think that those who think it, it takes a bit of narcissism to sort of be happy to sort of keep watching yourself on screen, doesn't it? Well, I, I don't know if, if I can't watch myself as well. <laughs> oh, so I, because I'm I thought I was alone. No, 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 you know, yeah. but but you know, some other actors will say to people, "How do you know what to do next time?" I said, "I know. The minute it gets off my mouth and the thing is recorded, I can see. I can tell you a thousand ways that I, mm. you know, I can do but, it." But also, good directors. I mean, how 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 important are directors to you? And in the sort of how important have they been in the course of your career? Directors are very important. I mean, um, there are some we call actors, directors, and there, were, there are some that are very, that are very methodical. You know, they they have dreamed it, and they don't really allow the actor to create. So we most actors prefer the ones who allow you create. They'll give you the general thesis of what they want, and then they let you create. So it's a, it's a co-creation it's your, kind yes, of thing. Yes, yes, because the actor really doesn't stop creating, mm. you know, and, and you can't, as the director, you have mapped it all out, you have the way your picture wants to play out, but I create more when 
sometimes when the scene is even over and I, I improvise, mm. some of my most memorable scenes that people see, there are scenes that I had to improvise. Right. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about longevity. So when yeah. you started out 30 years ago. 37, actually. Or 37. Professionally. 30 Post, post youth service. Okay. Um, <laughs> did you have sort of clarity regarding um, what you wanted to do and the fact that you were throwing your all into this and that what that this is what you wanted to do, build a career in film? I, I, I had clarity in, in, in the sense that I just wanted to act. I knew I also couldn't pursue it without having some kind of stability in terms of having some, some small regular income. So I was obsessed about getting a job, mm. a real job. But unfortunately, that was the time where there was an embargo on employment. Right. Uh, even with the graduating on top of my class didn't guarantee me getting a job. So I did part-time teaching for a while, dabbled into journalism. And when I finally did get a, a permanent job, it was in journalism. Mm. I was employed by a lady called Musu, who started a... Um, a general interest magazine called uh, Metro Magazine, mm -hmm. and I started out as a staff writer, uh, uh, you know, and that that sort of gave me stability that I wanted, puts food on my table, and then I knew I wanted to hustle from two p.m. or so, you know, trying to advance my acting career. Where it was going to lead me to, I wasn't sure. But I knew that I wanted a life of on, on television. Mm -hmm. Film wasn't big at the time. Um, it had sort of died because of um, the price of film and all of that. So television was really big. So I just knew I wanted to be, be on television. I was a child of television growing up. I watched it so much that I wanted to be part of those who were in the box. Mm -hmm. and, and I've ended up in that box. <laughs> yeah. and, and when I talk to people in the industry who've worked with you, part of what they talk about is your professionalism and the fact that, you know, you get to set on time, there's no diva behavior, the job gets done, um, and not just that, that it gets done, it gets done really, really well. Um, so if you were sort of talking to young actors now, what are the sort of things that you tell them about um, excelling and how to excel in this industry? Um, I always tell them to read. Um, I'm an avid reader. Uh, I, 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 I believe that the more perspective to life that you bring onto the craft of acting, the better for you. So your worldview is very broad. And so you would have encountered, no matter what character you're playing, you would have encountered it somehow in your readings and in your, in your uh, studies. Uh, and I also tell them to be very disciplined because it's like a boot camp. An actor mm. must be disciplined. Your body is, is your instrument, and every fiber of it, you must be able to control it and to obey you, you know, the way you want it to, to, to be. And, and so I always say to them, you, you have to be so professional to the point where, you know, even if it will hurt, but the audience has to be able to see that you are working from your, your truth. You have to be able to believe you. To what believe you, yes. You, you must come from a place of truth constantly. Um, I say to them that, look, I have, I, I have to prepare. An actor's life is about preparation, right? And so uh, for me, I have found that I see in pictures. So as I read, I have seen the picture, right. which is why probably... So you're I talking don't, about scripts, script, when they yeah, give you scripts, yeah. right? So, which is probably why I don't like to watch myself, because I have seen the entire film play. Right. When I'm doing it, um, I, I've seen it play, so I, you know, I, 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 give it, I give it everything that I have. So I always tell young actors... Just read, study your lines, and, 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 and don't stop creating until the camera cuts. Mm. You know. did, it, did it help that you had formal training? Because I know you went to University of Benin, and mm. I, if I remember correctly, you read theater arts. Yes, I did. Yeah, my, so, first, for my first degree. Yes. Yeah, so do, do you think that makes a difference? Um, Absolutely. Um, um, I'm one of those who also uh, is quick to say that... Um, the school curriculum should be changed or revised to, to, to show, to reflect modern day uh, reality. Um, I don't think that they, they taught us enough. It was still mostly by rote, you know, it was too theoretical based. But I tried to make sure that I did a lot of practicals, you know, uh, because at some point I noticed in schools that you could, you could go through an entire four-year program or three-year program in a 
theater department and not go on stage. Mm. I think that's wrong. <laughs> you know, yeah. and I think that theater should theater students should actually be, actually be made to do that either six months or one year um, internship, just like lawyers are sent to to chambers. Mm. When I was in law school, I was sent to. You know, and that's another that. thing. Why did you decide to then go back? <laughs> you, were, you, you already had an acting career. This, yes. You'd been a journalist. You'd gone now full scale into acting. And you were doing well. And then you decided, actually, no, maybe I need to study law. Why? A couple of reasons. You know, they all merged into, you know, to, to, uh, and became purposeful. Um, my mom... I'm an only child of my mother, and, and she always wanted me to be a lawyer. Um, Kadoya, fancy in 1980, there wasn't much to to a student who wants to go read study theater. Mm -hmm. So it was either law or medicine or engineering, and being a the typical Nigerian parent, the jobs that they considered proper jobs. Yes, and what's what's off? Uh, the average robo man or family thinks that there is uh, there is need for a lawyer in the family. <laughs> in, <laughs> case, to, in case they are lost. Is that, is that because Orobos are always uh, in fights and in trouble and needing legal advice? Maybe, yes, maybe because there's always, there's always some contention for land, <laughs> for landed property or yeah. something. What <laughs> Nigerians <laughs> accuse me of, of, of bias now yeah. and saying bad things. You know, no, it's, it's, it's said in jest. So please, yeah, know, anybody know, don't I, take this seriously. You know, so so that, that, that was the, my, my, my mom you know, and then uh, tragedy struck me. I, I lost my wife in '96, and it, it took it took a while. Uh, and I I was just constantly looking for something to bury my head in, mm. and and law, going back to school, sort of provided, you know, that avenue for me. And also law being very different from theater, mm. it, it meant that I needed to study. Mm. You know. And and I'll come back and talk a little bit um, later about whether that has helped you in the business, you no. know, of um, Nollywood. But because you raised me, Ellen Ezekiel, your wife, who, when we were young, we all looked up to. She was the ultimate um, a feminist, in my view, you mm. know, um, publisher of a magazine. Um, you won't remember this, but I met you guys. I saw you guys for the first time at a... At a birthday, no, sorry, Christmas party at uh, Momo's house. He was Minister of Information. Yeah. And he always used to do these Christmas parties. And we're kind of, I have, you know, a cousin who's married to a member of his family. And so we used to attend these Christmas parties. And I remember, I think we must have been around 20. One twenty-two, wearing hot minis, <laughs> generally feeling cool with ourselves, and then we saw you, and it was the first time. There was three of us, myself and my cousins, and you were with me, right? And we thought, oh God, he is so fine. Oh God, we started parading <laughs> up and down. <laughs> for me, I didn't. I didn't and look. He did, you did not have an eye for anybody <laughs> except her. <laughs> and we were just quite like broken hearted as, you know, um, teenage girls and sort of, you know, early 20s girls tend to do. I think my little cousin who was like 18 at that time was really heartbroken that you didn't notice. Her. And so, so, I mean, your love story with your late wife is something that people have talked about. What was it about her that made her so special? It would be hard to pin that down to to one thing, but it was just her heart. She she had a heart of gold. She very charming, extremely intelligent, and 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 extremely caring. She always wanted to give of herself. Uh, she couldn't, I mean, she couldn't stop wanting to give of something, dreaming up of something. How, what how to make humanity better, you know? So that that was her thing, and. And and I'm a people's person as well, and that that sort of really held us together. Mm -hmm. And mutual respect for for the work that we did. Um, we we had a mirror image, uh, so to speak. She would say, "I want to be everything that you are in 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 acting, mm -hmm. but I want to host." I want to be on television. I want to be like Oprah. Mm. And then there you are. You want to be a good journalist as well. So I said, oh, I want to be as good a writer as you are. Because she she could, you know how writers will pine for days to just write. She, May would just pick up her pen and start writing, you know. Uh, she would throw her column to me and said, you know, uh, review. And I would review and 
you know. So we, we had that thing. I would teach her how to do presentations for her talk show. And uh, I'll stay behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. You know, I just used to tell her, do your thing. Don't worry. There's no method to to it. Just let the talk from your heart. What was what was grieving and healing like? Whew, Kadera, there's no there's no uh, book on earth that can do that. I remember my pastor walking into uh, my house and telling me someday. I think it was him and his wife uh, saying to me that look. Don't let anybody deceive you. Nobody, nothing anybody will say to you would make any difference. Um, but you will heal. You know, um, just open your heart for for yourself to heal. You have to let. You have to want to be healed because there is also not wanting to heal. Um, I remember my refrain then was. I only just wanted people to leave me alone. Mm. Yes, you know, people would come. She was extremely popular. We were a popular couple. People would come from my house. I always just wanted, you know, people would say, I said, I just want to be left alone. I just want to be left alone. But nobody wanted that. Mm. You know, my auntie. In trying to be good, people good, were yes. sort of like. Yeah, you know, I even remember my auntie, even in Oputu, um, she would come to the house and say, and, and try to, crack me up with things, you know, uh, tell people to stay with me, she would bring stuff, and, you know, people really rallied around me, and um, that helped. Um, my, it's funny now, but, to remember now, but I, I also know that one of the things that helped me heal was music. Right. Yes, music. Music was so pivotal to my healing, and especially um, um, Christian songs, uh, they, they they took the place of prayers right. because at at some point you couldn't pray. Yeah. I couldn't pray, so I just I just chugged along, <laughs> you know, on autopilot, and and then gradually, you know, I met my present wife, and um, I would I would do everything to when I when I found out that. I liked her. I would do everything. To, I would throw everything to sort of to deny, sort of turn, t turn her off, turn her off, and right. and she would. Why was that? You were scared of I was committing now, again and then losing things. the person yeah, because you didn't do it again. So, Kadaria, I don't want to get emotional, but that was so strong. I had this f mortal fear that what if you marry and she dies again. You know, what would people say? You know, because there were all kinds of things that were being even said at the time. And so I didn't want to marry. I didn't want to have to complicate anybody's life. It would, it would just you be, saw yourself as a complication. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just wanted to be, you know, that who will want me now? But there was this young girl and she would brave it all and like, it's okay. I'm not, you know. And, and that sort of helped as well because she was like ready to wait you know and being young also helped and and it's amazing to hear rmd say that at some point in your life you actually asked who would want me oh, yeah. given the <laughs> image of you that everybody has but you you you, you are seen by and large as a as a sex symbol does that bother you sometimes um <laughs> How do you deal with it then? I, I ignore it. I ignore right. it. I am very basic. I, I think that being a worry boy has certain things, does certain things to your mind. It just makes you very basic because there are people who, no matter what I am, you know, in, to the world, they will still say Rishi Sidan, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. So I'm very grounded. And and my 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 friends are still the very old ones that I know, so they don't. I I don't I don't walk around with a, with a chip on my shoulder. So th that that has helped me. Mm -hmm. I, so I ignore it. How has your wife dealt with being married to someone who is so popular and so loved and admired by many, including a lot of women? Women, yeah, well, because she knows me, and I will always run home. I'm 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 very homely. I I am and, and I'm very domesticated. What most people don't know is that I'm very very domesticated. I guess being an only child, my mom brought me up well. I I cook. I clean. I wash. I I listen. You know. So I and and because because I grew up knowing only love. Mm. I I I can't I can't dispense hate or or afford to 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 break. 
you know, the bond that I have built, you know, with my wife. And, and so she sees through that. It's hard to cut through it sometimes. I mean, you know, um, there, are, there, there, there will always be challenges that will really test you guys. And, and, and yes, she has seen those, you know, but in all of it, I've always been true to myself and to her. Like, I am, I'm, 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 I'm human. I'm evolving. I am constantly trying to be a better husband, a better father, and a better human being. Mm -hmm. So she sees that. Mm -hmm. And and she's still 20-something years later, she still connects with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I saw pictures of you guys during your 60th, but also with the kids. What is it like being um, um, an actor and sort of having to disappear on set and then raise children, particularly when they were um, young? young? What was that like for you? uh, My wife did the ultimate sacrifice. I mean, she said to me, one person in the family is enough. She was on radio and on television Mm -hmm. and she told me that she was going to that you're going to have to look for another job for me and no wow. matter so she basically yeah, walked away from her she, own career no matter what i said she said nope i'm not going to do this with you i'm not going to i'm not going to be competing with you people are going to unnecessarily draw parallels or draw com- knock you know heads. knock that i'm leaving find me something else i don't want any public job um, so you know, I that said is quite she she did the ultimate sacrifice. She said no, and until date, I still tease her. She said, "Well, I can do radio someday, so maybe someday." Maybe we will bring her into radio <laughs> yes. now, yes. please. Yes. Yeah. She, because she's always loved radio, yeah. and she says to me, "Well, if I will ever do anything again, maybe you can, uh, you can we'll have a conversation yes. with her. <laughs> yes. She can do radio. Yeah. Yes, she says that's But how 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 also have the kids dealt with uh, being the children of someone this famous and this known? They, 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 they make fun of it. My son, <laughs> my son and my daughter, they just, my daughter enjoyed it when she was younger. You know, she would say to me, Dad, you have to come pick me from school today. Ah. You know, so I'll go, I'll go pick, him, pick her from school and she will make me walk around the entire school. <laughs> when there's in the hospital, she says, Dad, you have to come. And I'm like, okay. You know, um, you know, this whole R&B thing, I've seen it more in the eyes of, of kids. Mm. And that, that, that can really humble you. My daughter you was... Said, hang on, before you go, when you yeah. said that R&B thing, it's almost as if there is, um, there is you have like, a, there's Richard, the father, the husband... And then there's RMD, the superstar. A bit like the way the Beyonce's of this world talk about Sasha Fierce, it's, where yeah. they, you sort of create it's, yeah. that character that you project. Mm-hmm. Is that the same for you? For me, yes, absolutely. Sometimes I tease and I say, that RMD guy, I don't know him. <laughs> you know, he's just... Because people, people say... Some of my friends will say to me, or some of my workers will say to me, Papa, you have no idea what your name is. You know, you have no idea how big you are. And I said, I'm glad I don't because <laughs> it will probably mess me up. And uh, and that's 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 the one thing that I have been able to 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 dispense with. I I don't deal with it. I carry on as Richard. And if RMD comes into the picture, then you know I I, I compartmentalize it and deal so, with it. So separately. who am I talking to now? Oh, Richard, absolutely. Am I talking to Richard, or Richard, am I talking to Richard, RMD? Richard, Richard. You're talking to, in fact, you're talking to Mofe. You you have tried to sneak in RMD, but I <laughs> I parry him away. My kids don't 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 really know much about that. They just know that the name is is, is strong and it, you know. Um, they, they like they like it when it can open doors and give us privileges, you know. <laughs> Going to concerts by David. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh-huh. Sitting uh-huh. in the front row and uh-huh. meeting them backstage. Yes. My daughter, my daughter, my daughter will see David and she will go in. She will start to hyperventilate <laughs> and doesn't understand why others do it for you. For me, yeah. Isn't that crazy? I, we, we were doing a tour. I won't let her know, and we'll be eating. She will, you know. So maybe a quarter day we show up, and she will go. <laughs> My son is not faced at all. That one, she, he's such cool, a calm, geek. Collect, yeah, yeah, he's such a geek. And then Olamide day will show up, and she'll be like, oh, "Dad, Dad," <laughs> <laughs> you know. And the first time my daughter. Went to a Davido concert. I made sure they were in front. I didn't. Even, I refused to go to the concert. I just got them in and I left. Went back. When she came, she 
woke me up and she's kept telling me stories. Oh, that <laughs> like <laughs> you know, real flutters, you know. So I, I I look at her and I laugh, you know, like oh yeah, it's good to see the reaction from a different mm. uh, point. I mean, your your wife, um, even though you say she gave up her career, a creative, you a creative as well. Mm. Are the kids that way inclined, or are they pursuing totally different things? Totally different things. I mean, they like it. My my son, my son. Um, I think they filled his head with the fact that he looks better than his dad and, <laughs> tall, and taller than his dad. So he wants to model. Right. Um, he started out wanting to save the world. He's an animal lover from, from day one. Um, and now he, he's, he's doing uh, business. He's starting to be uh, doing economics and business and all that. But he also wants to model. Mm. And my daughter... She wants to be. A, she's doing. She wants to to work in law and reform the criminal justice system. Oh wow! Okay. <laughs> my my eldest daughter is in tech. She's in fintech. children with a conscience. Yes, they just want to do. But my eldest daughter, she she wants to change the world. You know, not just Nigeria. And do you think that has anything to do with you and your wife and and your values, I, or I, is it a mixture of multiple things? It's right? it's a mixture, it, but 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 mostly from what she sees. I, they know how passionate I am about about humanity and 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 about doing the right thing. I, I think that and about using love for for everything. I think that one of the things that I always advocate is that I think humanity we lost our way, we stopped loving and caring for each other. And it's as basic as just being nice to one another. Um, if you love somebody in spite of whoever he or she is, it breaks them. Mm. After a while, it does break them. It's like good energy. You bring it into a space, no matter how toxic that, that space is, if you hold on, everybody will begin to change gradually. And that's what I tell my kids. My kids know that it's important to be humble, to be respectful. That those are my values. It doesn't matter how big you are, how, how accomplished. accomplished, you know, I will be humble before anybody. And it doesn't matter. Younger people that are in their 20s have directed me and come to me after like, oh, it's such a pleasure. I say, yeah, but... You're the director. So I, I, I love young people. My staff, they're always very young. And they completely, you know, I had children early in life as well. So they completely changed my perspective about youth and how to deal with them. And, and I have found out that the best way to deal with young people is to show love first, you know, mm. and it, no matter, yeah, before, before anything else. Now, the, the, this message of love that you preach, um, many would argue our country, Nigeria now, is in sore need of that messaging. Um, if you look at sort of the issues that we're facing, we've never been as divided as we mm. are today. All our fault lines fully exploited. Um, how does that make you feel as someone who has this message of love and who by and large Nigeria has been good to, I think relatively, mm. if we sort of look at um, your career, how does it make you feel to look at the turbulence that we're going through right now? V very sad, broken, um, sometimes completely hopeless, um, because you, you, you tend to feel that there's there's no there's no way to approach it. But again, um, sometimes it gets it gets to get it has to get really bad for for new growth. Um, I spoke to to Ezra uh, Ulubi earlier on, and I know I know the Flutterwave people. I know all these young people in fintech, and I say to them that you guys are the new tribe. That um, technology and fintech now is addressing our everyday need, but elections too are part of our everyday need. And that over time, with NIN, with BVN, with with biometrics. Technology will begin to affect uh, how elections are run, votings and all of that. You're talking about the integrity of the process. Yes. So that will change the, 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 how that process is conducted. It will be harder to rig. To rig and all things. that. And then accountability and, res and leaders taking responsibility will become a thing. So I see that happening even faster than, 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 than we That seems to suggest that you think... Nigeria still has um, 
um, a life ahead because when you talk to I'll, people I'll, right now given what is going on there are many who keep saying oh we've run out of runway oh the country is about to implode um, if we don't get it right in 2023 um, it's going to all collapse that message that you just gave is a message of hope because you are seeing into a future in which there is still a Nigeria I, I absolutely I mean this is not to dispense with what is happening but I can't help feeling, I don't care if people think otherwise, but I can't help feeling that we've been here before. Mm. <laughs> we, we have been here before. And the, 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 the doomsayers, we keep saying that, oh, Nigeria, we conflagrate if X, Y is that. There's a, there's a breakdown and a failure in leadership at all levels, at all levels. There's a friend of mine who is who 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 says to me that, He's trying to do a series on on the the dirt in corporate Nigeria that mm. you have no idea how much private sector, yeah. the, how much dirt that is in private sector Nigeria names that you revere and all that if you know what they have done and sat down and superintended over people's finances and ruined homes and families and businesses and moved on to the next like nothing just happened that you will be repulsed. By, by, by their very existence, you know, in corporate Nigeria until today. But mm-hmm. um, again, uh, Nigeria is in dire need of of change of of of, of change makers and, and 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 leaders in whatever sphere you find yourself. I think that when we all lead in our little spaces and we drum it, we drum it, we will all of that will come together at some point and begin to affect policies and. and and, and how that, uh, you, you uh, flirted a little bit with public office because yes. you know at some point um, you were a commissioner in your state. Um, what was that experience like, and is it likely that you will ever go back into public office? Because I ask this because often people say the reason why we got into trouble and we're where we are is because good people we'll leave basically don't take public office. Yeah, I, I believe that, absolutely. Um, one of the, th- the biggest thing that I noticed when I got into uh, government was that the potential for change, for affecting people's lives positively, is so huge that if you really have a heart for it, you, you want to jump right in and, and, and begin to work, which was what I did. I, I noticed that, uh, things as basic. I, I'll give you. I'll give you this story. When I started touring my my ministry, Ministry of Culture and, and Tourism, I walked into an office and it was dark. So I called them and I'm like, "Why is this office dark?" They were like, "Oh, all the bulbs are broken and everything." And I'm like, "Okay, um, so how much is the bulb?" You know, and I'm like, and then it hit them where I was going, like maybe three hundred. And I put my hand in my pocket and I said, take, buy bulbs. Like, why would you sit in darkness? Yeah. You know, why? How? Okay, well, but it's somebody's work. Yes. So it's a mindset. Yes. Thing as well, but people but, but not you guys, yes. Responsibility. Yeah, you guys are sitting down here. Okay, so the ministry didn't provide money. Okay, so they provided money and somebody has ate it. But you are sitting here. Will 300 really kill you? I mean, people will give you a. a you know, uh, excuse that they don't have bios or pen, writing pens to to process files. I can't live with that. I can't deal with that. What Uh, do you think is responsible for getting us to a Nigeria where those kind of things are even possible? people People failed to be responsible and accountable for what they are supposed to do. What? How did we get to the point where Ro- things as basic as roads or water cannot be provided. It means that leadership just took leave of of their sense of responsibility to, to whoever they're with. You can still make your money. You can still be rich. Look, politicians can still live the life of affluence that they are living today, but still provide basic things like power and water and housing and good roads. Because when you do that, the economy increases and expands and even creates more jobs and everything starts to look up. I just came back from Kenya and sometimes you're ashamed about people that, you know, neighbors that you thought you were actually better than Mm -hmm. in terms of how your country is run. And you get there and you just find that 
because they have not departed from the basic human feeling of caring and responsibility and accountability they have their problems but they still know that you need to if your work is to provide access roads in a community you provide those roads but here it is so broken now that we don't even know from where to start so it can be so debilitating and so um so mind-boggling that sometimes you're like oh my goodness but again to go back to um, Your experience. To, to my experience, I wanted to to be to be the change that that I want, you know. And I tried the, where where the box stopped on my table, you will see the difference. But when the box didn't, when the box doesn't stop on your table, you then see that there's so much work to be done. But I looked at my age, looked at how much, how long it would take me to to get to the helm of affairs. I just didn't see how. I could do that within the space of time that uh, with the with the work that is ahead. You know, it's an urgent stable. Mm. You 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 need more than a Hercules to, <laughs> to, to clean it out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you need like ten Hercules working at the same time. And yet, you've not lost hope. No, I haven't, uh, because I believe that um, uh, I'm a firm believer in 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 technology democratizing the space. I've seen what technology has done in other places. And when, when the camera is in front of you, when there is CCTV, people behave differently. Mm. They force. I've seen Nigerians go abroad and behave like model citizens. So, so it tells you that we all can be model citizens. We just need to know that there is a system that we hold us accountable, accountable for whatever it is that we do. It is what you do when you are not even being watched that is more important. Than, than when you watch. Yeah, yeah. But to begin with, just know you're being watched. Being watched. And maybe yes, watched. yes. And, and you'll be held accountable. Are you therefore disappointed that um, we have a new electoral act which essentially doesn't include electronic voting despite the hope of many Nigerians that this is something that we'll begin to see in the next elections? Kareya, do you know that I have been in denial of that of that thing that I, I in my head I, I talked about it with Ezra today mm. and I said to him he said to me so what do you think about that I said you know what it might look really bleak now but trust me it won't be more than five ten years that this will come back to this conversation and it will take a singular movement and there will be there will be a paradigm shift and that law will be amended and there will be electronic voting. Because what is the use of NIN and BVN and all of these things we're doing? It's just, it just shames the entire process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, everything must build and pull towards... Accountability. Yes. And, and governments, state governments, you know, are already stopping payments for things through windows when you go and pay cash to some cashier collects them. Go to the bank. Bring your proof of payment. Let there be a central place to collect. Why would you do an electoral law in 2021 when your country and its citizens are, are, are some of the biggest players in the, in the tech space <laughs> you on, the know, continent. on the continent? And are clamoring for accountability in elections. It's, uh, but, I mean, you said something about in 10 years. So, I mean, I talk to friends who say to me, what you guys sometimes fail to understand is that, you know, eight years, 10 years, is a tiny little amount in the lifespan of a nation. And, you know, these things eventually will, will, will come to pass. Um, do you think art has a role to play oh. in, in nation building, in development, etc.? Absolutely. I mean, is the, the conscientization of, of a people is usually led by, by, by artists, be they creative, be they uh, people who work in, in the plastic arts or musicians or anything. Because there's something. When, when, you, when you decide that your life's journey is about creation, it is always for the finer things that are hidden in your area. Mm -hmm. So, a guy paints, and he paints from a very deep point. But once you are able to translate that and it comes out, people see it. And it begins to stir society in certain areas, in the face, and, 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 and change perceptions. And, and that's what musicians do, and that's what 
uh, theater artists do. That's what playwrights do. You know, imagine a con- that, that we didn't have people who can, from time to time, l- even lawyers from time to time, stand out and interrogate, you know, some of the things that are happening in our country. We, the arts have constantly played a pivotal role, showing car to Achebe and all that. I did a quote from, you know, uh, Ant Hills of the Savannah yeah. today, you know, talking about uh, writers and, and who they are, or artists and who they are, how they how they make governments and, and constitute authority feel uncomfortable because, you know, through, through whatever means, <laughs> you know, through a play, through a song, what would Nigeria be without Fela, without mm. playing his music today? Um, look at how Afrobeat has evolved and younger people are, are looking at it and, and playing it from a different point and Brenner has gone on to win a Grammy mm. and they listened I, I listened yesterday I was walking part of my exercise um, uh, music was that October 2020 mm. I listened to it again it's so visceral it's so when you hear the actual uh, recordings of what people were saying at the place when those gunshots were going mm. off and he was like, sit down. It's all in his music. Mm. My grandchildren will hear it. Yeah. You know, and people are already, I, I heard it again yesterday and it pricked my conscience again differently mm. like, okay, what, what, what can you do, do, do better, mm. you know, to make sure that this never happens again. Mm. You know? So, I mean, the, when we talk about the music sector in Nigeria, for example, I mean, they've literally like just They've exploded. They've gone global. They're influencing trends. They're influencing fashion um, across the globe, really. Um, And I don't think there's anyone that would argue now that the Nigerian music sector is as valuable as any other that you find in the world. And people are hoping that Nollywood would have that sort of explosion as well. I mean, across um, the continent, you guys are huge. Um, but people want to start seeing your movies in, in American cinemas, in British cinemas, that sort of thing. And part of the conversation that sometimes happens when you talk about Nollywood um, revolves around um, um, the, the role that film can play in imagining and which we haven't quite seen Nollywood begin to do. And, and just to give you an example of what I mean, um, before America had a black president, there was, you know... Uh, a, series, a different series, series, yes. About a black the president. president yeah. So there's a way in which art, you know, can actually project the future and help people imagine, mm-hmm. you know, um, what is possible. We haven't seen Nollywood sort of, you know, do that quite yet. Um, what are your views regarding how Nollywood is evolving and the things that are left to be done? We, we are well on our way there. Um, there are not enough access to fund is still a major challenge, and so people are are quick to just do the do and tell the stories that is within their grasp. Mm-hmm. But you will find that auteurs like Kemi Adetiba, uh, entrepreneurs like Mo Abudu, and and very creative uh, 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 producers are already inching, in, and even on stage, inching to produce things that are very futuristic. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw a film the other day called Ratnik, just trailer of it, you know, and it's so futuristic. I so, saw, I saw, I've seen the full movie. Okay. You know, I was um, a judge in the um, Africa Awards. Uh, what? I think oh, okay. Two years ago. Okay. So, um, so, so, so there, there are people already. The thing. There are people already reimagining things yeah. and all that, and and just yeah. being seen on platforms that are streaming cinemas from every other culture, and us holding our own. Um, uh, I said yesterday, uh, part of what was trending was King of Boys, mm-hmm. uh, The Return of the King. And it's so gratifying to know that in remote villages in Venezuela and, and Colombia and Brazil and all kinds of places, uh, people are talking about Nigerian movies now. And um, I heard again, I don't, I've, not, I've not confirmed this, that a Nigerian has just been headhunted by Amazon Prime Video as the head of acquisition. It's true, I can confirm it. Hey, so <laughs> Wangi. It, yeah, yeah. And and that 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 again is 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 is, is validation for the quality of work we're doing here. So film will take a, a while longer 
to do what music is doing. But if it can do it on, 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 the, on the subcontinental level, then it can do it globally as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's going, to be, it's going to be even faster now that our films are streaming in platform in the biggest platforms you know in the world. Mm -hmm. I know that since Amazon Prime Video is here now, Disney will soon be here as well. Yeah, so these are all indications of how far Nollywood can go in, in now the future. Now, obviously, with, with entertainment, um, um, with the arts, what a lot of people see is the, the audience you see is the sort of frontal audience facing end results, if you like, the product. Um, behind that, of course, there's the business, mm. you know, of movie making. There's the business of music making and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so... How much, because you are considered quite successful, so not just because you are in front of a s camera, but because you seem to be able to make a really comfortable living from your art. It's not always that easy. How much of your law degree has influenced the way you run your business as an actor? Um, it has a lot. I, I mean, when you become a lawyer or... Well, let me let me illustrate by by one of the lectures one of the lectures I, I attended in Unilag, uh, Professor Chebu, God bless his soul, is late now. He you know he he gives this lecture that when you come out of his class you feel like you are ten feet tall, mm. and you know and he says that you're you're coming to study law in Unilag in this age that you are in is probably the best adult decision that you will ever make in your entire life. And, and, and it's true for me because it just opens your eyes in different directions. It helps your negotiation. It helps your... It helps how you value yourself and all of that. And for and me... And you can read contracts. Yeah, and of course. And understand the written... Of, the tiny, of course. Tiny and then you even become... A, you, you, you can even by extension... I mean, my friends will always call me and say, bros, how you... Help me with my contract. You know, what do you think about this? The kind of pro bono work that I do <laughs> in terms of cons consultation is a lot. Uh, for me, it has been a thing that I've been doing from time because my being a journalist, I always make sure that everything that I, I go outside to do, I bring it back to bear on, on the value I place on myself in doing my work as an actor. So you cannot de then just look at me and not see what I'm bringing to the table. So it is... Uh, man, after all, is is a storehouse of value, mm. you know. So when I come, I come as a storehouse of value. When you unfold or as the, you begin to unravel my value, you will you will at some point feel intimidated to look me in the eye and, and offer me crap <laughs> <laughs> because because I have I have a choice to say no and I walk away. Mm. But if you really want, because I also um, bring, you know. Um, the integrity of my art to my work, you will also know that if you do need that kind of work, you will have to come to me ultimately and mm -hmm. sit in front of me and have to negotiate what you're going to have to pay. And I, and I think that to a large extent, it, it has inspired um, a lot of the younger people coming. I've even had cases where I go out of me, not just for me, I always say that it is for the next generation of actors. I, I've had issues with brands that will come to me and I will say no. And they'll be like, how can you refuse this money? Um, and I will say, because a DM is behind me. Mm. You know, um, a Gideon is behind me. A Ramsey is there. A Desmond is there. If they get to where I am today and they find out that I have been I, I I accepted to take ten naira. You compromised. Then, yeah, then then you will give them the same ten naira, which is not a good thing, I mm. think. So mm. for me, it's not about me anymore. It's about being a leader in my sector, and carrying that position of leadership, knowing that I am not doing it for self anymore, but I'm making sure that the next people. They always say to me, "Oh, I want to be like you." And they always will hear me say, "No, you'll be bigger because if you if you grow up and be like me, then you have not grown. Mm. You must be bigger so that the next person will be bigger." So I, I do that with younger actors all the time, making sure that their eyes are open and they, they add value to their lives and tell them that, "Look, what I'm doing, you need to support what I'm doing." Because some of them are so frightened to speak up that they would take anything. Mm. you know, uh, that they are offered because they just want to be seen. Just like musicians too. Some of them will take anything. They just want to be recorded in the studio. But one year down the line, they're like, oops, mm. 
I need to I need to review this. You know, you know, I can't do be the monster hits Baker and then get thirty percent or twenty percent of whatever it is that is out there. For for those who sort of want to play um, in your sector and um, for people sort of listening, what are the things that are are required? And I'm not talking just in front of the camera. Um, I'm talking about what what sort of infrastructure, what sort of support does Nollywood need? What are the sort of things that people can get into? Um, that will give them value in Nollywood that are not necessarily about acting and mm-hmm. all of that. Oh, that's, I mean, mm-hmm. it takes a world or it takes a village to make a film. And so um, if you know how much we have affected, you know, uh, even the architecture and the fashion and the technology of the world, um, then you see, you know what's, you know uh, what the need. So just, just having good governance, good governance in the first place. Just Lagos State creating a film board and making sure that permits are easier to access, and um, uh, Nigerian police making it easier to apply to to for uniforms and all of that. If 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 we can have. Um, you know that thing they say about an enabling environment. Oh, yeah. Every sector responding to the needs for the, making it making 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 it easier to just access the army, the police, the custom, private sector, banking, everybody, government. Just having access, better access, easier access to all of these things will make you know Nollywood better. You're also doing some collaborative wor- work with us, and I-, I want this to be the big reveal okay. <laughs> about the partnership that you have with Radio Now. So can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing with us? Okay, it- it's called The Book I'm Reading. Um, it- it's, I think that it's a, it's a program that its time has come. Uh, for, for, for the most part, we are constantly talking about people don't read, people don't want to read. So let's help them by revealing Nigerians distinguished and in all their fields uh, that they read and what book they are reading and how the books are helping them navigate life, mm. you know, how it's impacting their lives and all that. So, yeah, so that's that's what it is. And, and I'm looking forward to talking to as many people as, as possible and exploring the power of books and how it can change your we, lives. We are very excited that um, you said yes to this partnership. So when is the first edition? I think you can listen to the first edition of September 3rd. Fantastic. So keep it locked, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Richard Mofe Damijo, or should I say Mofe, for joining us on quarter to 12. I definitely won't say RMD because it wasn't RMD I was talking to. Thank you for having me. That's it for the August edition of quarter to 12. Remember to catch Radio Now's new show, The Book I'm Reading, which is hosted by RMD. Quarter to 12 will be back with another edition in September.